These are the top five hardest projects that I've worked on since I've been here at Titans of CNC. A lot of times in our videos it looks like we're just perfect and we're the experts at everything and we never have any issues we're never nervous but that is absolutely not the case there's a lot of things that you guys don't see on camera that we have to sort through in order to be able to make a video for you guys to see if that is not a statement piece i do not know what it is so, so I first off i want to talk about the gas monkey grill now this project was super difficult because after I had everything modeled, I only had six days to make a good cosmetic part that Gas Monkey would be proud enough to display at the SEMA show in Vegas. Now in addition to only having six days, I had to keep in mind that the guys at Gas Monkey also needed time to be able to install this on the truck. Now because of that time crunch, I knew I had 60 hours worth of machining to do on the grill, and that's not counting anything that I might have had to tweak after I finished running those 60 hours worth of tool path. So what that meant was that me and the camera guys had to work a lot of extra hours. So we were here nights and weekends. So we worked 12, 16 hours a day. And any good machinist and programmer knows that as you start getting tired, you start making mistakes. So I was really concerned that I was going to end up making a mistake in the tool path and gouge our part. Now, if I had gouged that part, we had only ordered one piece of material to make this thing. I didn't have time to order another piece of stock. I didn't have time to start over. So a mistake would have meant that Gas Monkey didn't have a grill for their truck and they couldn't have sent that truck to SEMA. Another problem is a lot of the projects that we do for our videos, especially in aluminum, we try to run dry. That way you guys can see what's happening. Now this was an extremely cosmetic part and it was pretty much the centerpiece of that truck. So if I would have had a single end mill gall up and scar our part, it would have ruined the whole project and there would have been no video and once again, no truck at SEMA. Another problem that we had is that the pieces of stock that I had to use to make this grill were technically too big for the machine. I had originally programmed this for our Minx that was being installed, but it turned out that the Minx wasn't gonna be commissioned in time for me to work on this project. So I had to reprogram the part to take out all of the bigger face mills and things that I was using because it just didn't fit in my work envelope as I came around the outside of the stock. Now the hardest part of that project that we really didn't talk about much in the video was getting the original scan from Gas Monkey of an old, beat up, rusty, warped grill and having to convert that not only into a solid, but into a completely new design that would actually fit on the truck. What you guys didn't see is it took me around 40 hours to start from that scan and then recreate every single surface of the original grill. And then I was able to start the redesign process until I ended up with a solid that was actually usable in Mastercam. We had the time crunch, we had the machine size, we had the cosmetic issues, we had the lack of sleep, we had the design issues. But in the end, we were successful and I'm super proud of how that grill came out. It really looked great on the truck and Gas Monkey was super happy too. 1972 GMC 1500 custom pickup. I have sold $245,000 on the phone. All right, the next hardest project that I wanted to talk about was the big valve that we did on the Abarmia. Now this part was 1,700 pounds and the work holding method that we chose to use was kind of unconventional. So we had four vices set up on our tombstone and this was a horizontal machine. So we were holding a 1,700 pound piece of steel on a quarter inch dovetail. And what this did was cause a leverage effect where all of the weight of the part was hanging out here in space and just a little dovetail was holding on to our stock. For one thing, I wasn't sure that A, the steel that we used for the jaws was gonna be strong enough, especially when I started putting cutting forces into the material. And I didn't know if as soon as I touched that material, if it was just gonna rip the dovetail off the front of all four jaws and end up dropping that huge piece of stock onto our way covers. Now in the very beginning, before I ever made chips or before I ever loaded the material, me and Titan sat down and we started looking at all the sheer strength of the bolts that we were using. And it turned out that all the bolts and things were gonna be more than strong enough, but I was still concerned about that dovetail. Now one thing most machinists will experience in their career is not being extremely confident in their work holding solution. Sometimes you come out ahead and sometimes you end up flinging apart across the shop. Yeah, let's not bring up the disco ball guys. You know, things happen. 
But a lot of times, you know, your experience comes into play here. You know, you'll know things that you got away with before, and you'll know things that you didn't get away with before. And in the end, me and Titan talked about this thoroughly, and we decided that this was probably going to work. Worst case scenario, you guys were going to get an extra crash video out of me. Now another issue I had on this project was I had never used a Heidenheim control before. I would used Siemens and I would used Fanuc and I would used Haas and I have used a lot of different control types out there, but I would never used Heidenheim. Now when you're on a 5-axis mill and you're not familiar with the controls terminology, that can lead to some problems and I did have some problems especially with setting my work offsets. Now one of the first things that I did on that machine was load our new tombstone and then do a pallet change. Well, I didn't realize that the PLC program didn't have written into it the head going home. So as soon as the pallet change completed, the pallet moved forward with the tombstone on it and smashed directly into our spindle. So the first thing I had to do there was contact the Barmy and let them know they might want to add a home position to their pallet change. The next issue I had with this part was I was using an unproven post. So this post had just been written by Mastercam and a lot of us know that a brand new post might have a couple of little quirks to it. Well, I didn't have a chance to prove this out on anything, so I was testing the post while I was making this part. Any programmer and any machinist knows that that can be a hairy situation, and I did have a couple of close calls. Now, another problem that I had with this part is I wanted the machining footage to be really impressive. I mean, what's the point of making a video if you're just gonna go 10 inches a minute? So, I decided to use a four inch diameter high feed mill. Now, I knew this high feed mill's inserts were gonna be in cut for literal hours. And I was really worried that if the inserts blew, the amount of force that was gonna be put into that part may have been just enough to rip that part out of the dovetails again. Unfortunately, with what we do here at Titans of CNC, sometimes we just have to take those risks and see how things go. Once again, this was a project that we were successful at and I was super proud by the time it was done because all of these unknowns just came together in a way that actually worked. In the end, the best way to learn a new control and to prove out a post is to actually be there on the machine running apart. So the next challenging part that I had here was the tower of terror or the ball valve for the ship. Now right out the gate, I had some challenges here that I was gonna have to overcome that made me extremely nervous. The way we wanted to approach this part was using the Vero S pallet system that had four modules on it. And we wanted to stand the 16 inch diameter, 2200 pound by 36 inch long part vertically. In order to do that though, I had to put the four pull stud holes in the end of the stock. Now we didn't have a machine that was really suitable for doing this at the time. So what I had to do was lay this piece of stock over on its side and actually use chains and straps from Home Depot How doers get more done to hold the part in place. Now in that video you may have heard me say sketchy like 87 times. Sketchy. Or sketchy. 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 Sketchy or sketchy. Yeah! And that's because it was that sketchy. My main concern was that while I was drilling the stock for the threaded holes that it was going to push that whole piece of material across the pallet. Thankfully that didn't happen. Now next up, I had to load that part onto the Vero S pallet system. Now, I talked to Shunk and Shunk assured me that this pallet system was gonna work just fine, I had nothing to worry about. The problem is, is that my center of gravity now was so much higher that I had to worry about my pallet change. When the pallet changer lifts that whole pallet up, there's nothing locking it onto the pallet. It's simply sitting on cones. So with the centrifugal force of the pallet change, I was worried that that high center of gravity was gonna cause the entire part and pallet just to flip over into the machine, and that would have been a nightmare. Now there was no way to control the speed of the pallet change, but what I could do is instead of running it in full automatic mode, I could just bump it so that it just moved a little bit at a time. Now that was scary too, because that was creating kind of a jerking motion, and I didn't want to get such a jerk that the pallet started tipping and just went all the way over. Now the next thing I had to consider with this part was the tooling that I was going to use. Now even though Shunk had assured me that their quick change pallet was going to be strong enough to hold the material, I had to be concerned about the axial forces that I was putting into the part. So of course initially I wanted to use a high feed mill because then I can remove material pretty quick, but I was worried that that jackhammer effect of a high feed mill was going to cause me vibration issues with the part standing up as tall as it was. So what I opted for instead was a one inch end mill because this way I was getting radial cutting forces and it was a lot smoother and a lot less of an interrupted style cut. Something else I had to consider a lot was the chips. Now because we're running dry and we're just running through spindle air, I knew I was going to be making literal mountains of chips. So I had to be really aware of 
how the chips were building up in my chip conveyor, how they were getting into my augers, and how they were building up on the part itself because what I didn't want is to be recutting chips. And in that video, you can actually see a few times where that started to happen. Now, one thing I noticed during programming this part was as I was doing my dynamic OptiRough tool paths, I was ending up with a lot of big, long posts because I was cutting three inches deep. So in a previous video, I'd showed a method where I created a funnel shape using a thread mill tool path to mitigate that big post breaking off while I was machining. Once again, this method proved to be extremely effective and it's something that I still use every day here. In the end, this is another part that I got lucky with and everything came out perfect. Uh, I did end up breaking some consumables, but you know, that's to be expected when you're doing a part that has over 40 hours worth of machining on it. All right, next up was our shrouded impeller that we did on the HF5500. Now this was another case where I had to do an extremely complicated part and I only had one shot at it, one piece of stock, and it had to come out perfect for the videos. That's always stressful when you're a machinist, when you have to do a one piece order, you have one piece of stock, and you can't make a mistake. Now one of the main challenges with this part was there were so many surfaces that needed to be machined. If you look at the outside diameter of the part, there's fillets everywhere that blend into other features. I mean, there was a lot of toolpath required in the programming stages. So by the time I was done with the program, I know I had over 350 toolpaths, and you know, statistically speaking, the more toolpaths you have, the more likely you are to have an error. Now, a lot of the work that I did on this part was three plus two, and what that meant is that I also had over 50 different planes that I had to choose from. Now, by the time I had 300 toolpaths in my Mastercam file, it really started to bog my computer down because that is a lot of toolpath. So I had to start a completely new file using a stock model generated from my previous file, and that sped things up significantly so that I was able to actually finish the part. Now, something I want to point out is 350 toolpaths is a lot of toolpath, and we don't use any true verification software here like NC Simul or Vericut. So, I put all of my faith in Mastercam simulation. Now sometimes your post-processor can do things that your software doesn't show you. Lucky for me, I had a really solid post and everything worked out fine. I didn't have any collisions, any crashes, but that was something that I was super concerned about. Now, once I was done making chips on this part and saw that I had no collisions, crashes, or gouges, I was super happy with Mastercam, so thanks guys. Now, the last thing on this part is a common theme here at Titans of CNC, and again, I was trying to run everything dry. When you're trying to get really nice cosmetic finishes and you're using end mills and aluminum, it can get pretty hairy. I mean, an end mill can gall up in an instant and by the time you notice it, your part's damaged. So one thing you guys don't see a lot is sometimes what I'll do is I'll spray our part with WD-40. This gives me just enough lubrication that the end mill doesn't gall as long as I'm not doing things like ramping into a hole. I remember back when I was doing impeller work. So All right, last but not least is a video that a lot of you may not have seen out there because I did it around the time that I had first started here. And this is when I tried to get a piece of aluminum to play the song Jingle Bells. Play the song Jingle Bells. <laughs> Now in the end, I got a lot of grief from people who were saying that I was tone deaf or why even post this video because it sounded nothing like the song. Well, there were a lot of factors that you guys didn't get to see that were involved in this project. First of all, in order to get the notes right on this part, I downloaded an app to my phone. So I would cut a fin, I would run my fingernail across the top of it, and then my phone would tell me what note I had achieved. What you guys didn't get to see is that we had a lot of electrical work being done in the shop that day. So I had a scissor lift right next to my machine all day going beep, 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 beep. So every time I tried to play a note, I also got the note of the scissor lift. So that made it extremely difficult for me to tell whether I was getting the note off of my part or if I was getting it from that super annoying beeping. Another thing you guys may not have known is I started this project two days before our Christmas break. So I thought it would be super easy. You know, I cut a fin, play the note with my fingernail, see what the note was on my phone. And then once I had all of the notes that I needed, I would know exactly how to put the fins in order. Well, it wasn't that easy. So what I had decided to do was just use a chamfer mill and drag it across the tip of each fin, and then it would play the song for me, right? 
wrong because every time that chamfer mill touched the fin it was taking a tiny little chip out of the fin which was changing the note now if i would have had more time i would have started over and just used something like a, a stylus or something to drag across it but by this point i was already committed there were a ton of other factors on this part that i didn't even consider because in the end i'm not a musician i'm a machinist so there were things like the fact that I was clamping in the vices on both ends of this stock and there was all this empty space in between. Well, that changed the resonance of the material. So even though a fin length would be the correct note in one spot, further down the material where it wasn't being held in a vise, that fin was a completely different note. Now I worked really hard on this project and Titan knew that. And I was pretty sad in the end that I didn't get the song perfect. So he decided to release the video anyway and unleash the entire internet on me for being a tone deaf moron. And I approve this message. In the end, I may be an expert, but I'm not perfect. You know, I get these projects here, I come up with a project, I run into problems, I run into issues, I run into challenges, and I solve them. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. They may not be the way that you guys would have chosen to solve a problem, but in my experience, they're the way that I chose to solve them. Here at Titans of CNC, we try to give you guys videos that'll either educate you, entertain you, or that you can relate to, or maybe just plain show you something cool. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Please like and subscribe, and I'll catch you guys again soon.